Well, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, I'm going to say this evening, so that, that way I keep my head straight as to the as to the time zones. So please do excuse it as we go through. Um, now, before I begin, uh, what I want to start with is an acknowledgement of country. And this is something that for those of you who might not be familiar with um, Australian practices, this is a way of us acknowledging the land upon which we work and live, and a way of acknowledging um, uh, our First Nations Australians who came before us. I have always said that it's something that I feel very strongly about doing, because one of the things that we do so much in open is that attribution is just a cornerstone of what we do. We acknowledge the work of people who have come before us and as well as researchers, this is something that we do. And I think that this is just a way of extending that into our everyday lives. And so um, I would like to, in the spirit of rec reconciliation, acknowledge the fact that the lands upon which I work and live are uh, are uh, under the custodianship of the Gaibal and Jarawa people, and they always have been, always will be. I also show my deep respect for elders past, present and emerging. And I would also like to express my gratitude for um, the input that First Nations Australians have into the university's enterprise, in this case, the University of Southern Queensland. Now, I talk about that because, as I said, it is building upon the work of, of those who have come before me, acknowledging the fact that Australia, well before white settlers arrived here, was a place of learning, it was a place of research, and it was a place of disseminating knowledge. And that's what we're here for um, tonight. So just to give you a bit of an overview, this is going to be a highlight, as it were, from uh, my thesis, which was only recently submitted um, in its final form. And as we go through, uh, I will ask you to just leave questions until the end, or if you do have a comment, throw it in the chat, and I'll take the time to make sure that I'm looking at the chat as well. I can address that at the end we can certainly unmute and, and have a bit of a conversation. That's really what I'm looking forward to. So as was mentioned beforehand, I am a PhD student with the University of Tasmania. I work for the University of Southern Queensland and I am a proud member of the GOGN. Um, and that has been a source of great encouragement all the way through. So to give you a very quick background on me, I'm a librarian. I've been a learning technologist, a learning designer and for a very long time been an advocate for open education. And I have a very strong interest in the university's role in a participatory dem democratic society. And that comes through in, in a lot of my writing. Um, I can say PhD candidate uh, because I, I am waiting for my, my letter in the post now. Um, and for those of you that might want to connect with me, one of the best places is Twitter, where I go by Open Curacol. So before we begin, though, if we're going to be acknowledging people, um, two people really need to be acknowledged, and they are my supervisors, um, Dr. Karina Bossu and Professor Natalie Brown. And I have used a, a metaphor of light um, throughout the introduction of my thesis. And Karina and Natalie have been like the lighthouses for me. Uh, every time thing gets, every time things get a bit dark and rocky or I have lost my way, I could always rely on their light. Um, and they have always been there for me. And also the support of the GOGN as I have gone through connecting with other students and also the great opportunity to attend the workshops in Delft a few years ago was probably one of the most fantastic experiences for me as, as an emerging researcher. So I would like to thank uh, both my supervisors and also the, the GOGN as we proceed. So in terms of what we're going to look at uh, tonight, really it comes down to four things. What did I set out to do? How did I do it? What did I find? And what does it mean? And uh, hopefully we can spend a bit of time exploring those. And I'd also like to note that what I've done with the presentation is I put way more words on these slides than I would normally do. That is to say, there are words on my slides. Now, 
the intent here is that I'll provide my slides after this so that if there is anything that you would like to examine in more depth or follow up on, you will be able to do so with the information that I've provided through the slides. So let's start at the very beginning. What did I actually set out to do, these first steps? Well, what I noticed was that going through um, the literature around the experience of open educational practice, it's very easy to find things such as general perceptions, uh, case studies of activities, attitudes towards open policy, learning and teaching, and then to a much lesser degree, how open education is actually supported. What I found was that the studies that actually examine the interaction between practitioners and their environments were very rare. And to me, it felt like a gap that needed um, some attention, simply because we don't spring from the ground whole cloth um, and enter universities. We are actually the sum of our experiences. And I'm always very interested in what motivates people and why people do the things that they do. So this led me um, to be exploring the ecology or at least uh, conceptualizing the higher education environment as individual ecologies. So I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of some terminology here. Ecology, when I use it, is very broadly speaking, the relationships between an organism and their environment. So in this case, the relationships that form between a, uh, an open practitioner and all other elements of the environment in which they are practicing. So the institution, this could be things like policy, it could be the um, historical stance of the university. It could be the mission of the university. It can be other colleagues, sources of support, those sorts of things. And what we see emerging is a complex series of interrelated and interdependent connections across that. That was what I was really interested in exploring. And this notion as well that I'll probably come back to several times is that context is everything. And that plays out through the research design and also through uh, the way in which I'll, I'll contextualize some of the findings here. But before we begin, one of the biggest contexts, contexts obviously, is the Australian higher education environment. Now, being very mindful of my audience tonight, I can see that I have some Australian colleagues here with me and some people who have worked in Australia, but it might be a very different environment. Basically, um, if, if you get the potted history of higher education in Australia, universities were created originally to serve the growing colony. There was a, uh, there was a concern that there wouldn't be enough skilled graduates um, in order to take on positions and advance the colony, and so we needed universities. Vocational education had already been set up in Australia. There's been a very long history of that. And then they decided that this was needed for the next step. We built our system very much on the uh, on the Scottish Enlightenment, um, and then borrowed elements from the from Germ uh, from the German higher education system in relation to research. And these were most notably the idea that students didn't need to live on campus, that you could have very large class sizes, and the correspondence models were perfectly acceptable. Something that still con continues to this day. Every university in Australia is created by an Act of Parliament. And that Act of Parliament sets out the duties, the responsibilities and the functions of that university. And each one of these acts does, in fact, differ from other universities. We only have 42 uh, universities in the entire country, two of which are private and uh, one of which is um, owned and administered by a board of directors. The other is a theological college. And really, over the last probably 30 odd years, uh, at least since 1988, uh, higher education has really been marked by a student pays scheme. Uh, in 1988, we shifted away from government funded places to students need to pay their own way. Uh, performance based funding, government mandated targets and more recently, a very strong amount of pressure from the federal level to commercialize our outputs and to look for new ways to um, collaborate with industry in order to generate more of a research income for the universities. You'll see there that there's a range of other items, which for most of you are probably not new at all. 
So in terms then of what I was looking for, let's formalize these into the three research questions. And that is what types of open educational practices do Australian higher education staff currently engage with? The reason for this is because there are a number of research studies in Australia which look at this at a national level. Um, some of those works are, um, are now over a decade old um, and there isn't an awful lot in the way of material filling the gaps. The second one, one aspects of the university ecology exert influence over the open practitioner. So this one is specifically looking at what is it about the institution that shapes practice and how does it shape practice? And then what does that practice look like? And the last one here, what are the core elements of a functional higher education ecosystem that supports fulsome and authentic engagement? And in fact, one of the things that I talk about around this is what creates a flourishing ecology. It's not good enough to have something that is maintained. It's not something that's not good enough to have something which is established. What we're looking for is something that flourishes, grows, can be nurtured. And these these were my guiding principles as I went through. In terms then of how did I do it? I really um, adopt a pragmatist paradigm for this. And when I'm talking about the idea of looking at what shapes a human being, what is it that they bring to their practice and how does that inform how they go about their practice every day? This means that you're willing to embrace multiple truths. So under a pragmatist paradigm, you don't look for a single capital T truth. You are looking for a way of, of knowing a truth or multiple truths. Also, what it does is it looks for ways to combine research methods in order to best answer the research questions. So this led, of course, to me adopting a mixed methods approach, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. And the last thing that, that I'll mention in here is that uh, a few years ago, I came across this methodology of friendship, which I think is, is absolutely critical um, to a study like this, because methodology of friendship, it states that the researcher is an insider. They are part of the phenomenon in which is being investigated. They have got some sort of privileged access as well to the community, but as well as that, they also want to see the phenomenon um, grow, flourish, and they want to advocate for it as well. And this is something that, that is accepted by the researcher. And also it is something that, that um, you are able to connect more strongly with your community of respondents over. So now if we look at the landscape, what I uh, did originally was administered a survey over um, three case study sites. This was followed up by um, interviews, as well as that some analysis of things like policy documentation, legislation, strategic plans. Uh, I also looked at whether or not they had um, current or emerging partnerships with open organizations and a, and a range of other sources of evidence. What you're trying to do here is essentially form a narrative. You're getting as many forms of evidence as possible and where I mentioned thick description, this is really about very purposefully selecting people within the institution who are deeply embedded within the phenomenon and can provide really rich data for you. And so that was a reason why, um, for the interviews at least, that was a smaller, in terms of the sheer numbers, it was a smaller phase of the data collection, but certainly the interview transcripts, going through those and analysing them, that was by far the largest source of data that I had. And then really it's developing three narratives of practice across the three case study sites. Which then brings us to, if I'm constructing a narrative, we need a framework, we need something to hang it off of. So this is where Bronfenbrenner's work um, comes to the fore. I used Bronfenbrenner's theory of human development, which essentially says that you can't really generalize psychological processes or decision makings. You can't, you can't generalize these across a human population. You can't study people in a lab and expect it to be authentic. 
Instead, what you do is you recognize that as a person develops, as they change over time, this is a result of external factors, also um, internalization of those factors. And so he sought very much to have both a descriptive and explanatory view of psychology. And rather than seeking the truth, as I mentioned just before, it is really about understanding a truth or a truth as it applies to an individual. And in order to do that, we break reality up into four main areas. A microsystem, this is really about the individual. So what happens here is that this is your relationship with other peers and your immediate relationship, things like your family, your immediate peers, um, those people whom you have close relationships with or constant relationships with. And these, of course, impact on your development. The MISO system occurs when more than one microsystem um, impacts. So say, for example, in a microsystem, I will have a very particular guise or a particular front. So the me at work is different to the me at home. It is also different to say the me with my friends. So what happens with MISO systems is when those systems come into, into play, for example, if someone at work were to interact with me whilst I am me with friends, this means that there's a negotiated space there where I'm trying to figure out in many ways, who am I in this situation and what do I allow to be seen and unseen? And then how does that influence how I react to people? The exosystems, these are much larger um, areas and much larger systems within your immediate environment. Generally speaking, they exert a downward pressure on you and you don't have an awful lot of ability to change those. In this case, this would be the institution is an exosystem. So if you think about working for an institution, there are a whole range of things that you can and can't do um, or that you are asked to do and not to do. Whether or not you actually go through with that, we'll come to that in a moment. And then at the highest level, we have the macro system. This represents culture. So in this case, a macro system um, will represent the nation of Australia in which higher education is a small part. And really, what is it within the Australian environment that exerts a pressure? And you see that there are interrelationships across these four levels. The last thing to, to bear in mind is that I said that these were case studies. There are three of them and I'm taking a bounded case study approach. This basically means that each one of the case sites is discrete. I'm not looking to generalize, even though some of the things that I talk about tonight, I will talk about commonality. I will talk about shared experience, but my intent is not to put all three cases together and say, well, this place is better than this place because, because you simply can't do that because each place is a discrete environment with its own narrative. The way in which I selected the case sites was uh, by uh, a range of uh, criteria looking to see whether or not they had policy which supported uh, strategy, whether or not they had open platforms and a range of other things. And what happened was I had three universities where for the most part they were able to tick yes and this was done with a desktop audit. So having my three universities, metropolitan, state and regional. This also gave me a bit of a difference in terms of the types of institutions that were being looked at and also the extent to which they served particular cohorts of students, how much of their uh, curriculum was online, uh, what sorts of um, things they prioritised in terms of teaching and learning, research and the other functions of the university. So that's really how we arrived at there. And I'd sum this area up by saying that it's really that initial perceived lack of understanding of practitioners in their environment. Understanding um, this notion through uh, the lens of a pragmatist paradigm and also through this methodology of friendship and then looking to construct overlapping uh, research methods so that I can answer those three research questions. Right, so that brings us then to the, to the what did I find out there?
And one of the ways that I have of um, at least describing this is kind of a nested approach. And the reason why you'll see with each one of the four systems here that I have got a dashed um, type of line around it is because this really acknowledges the fact that they are porous in nature. You can't really compartmentalize, say, for example, learning and teaching processes or, or practices within a particular system and then say they're walled off from everything else. Um, so that's the reason why you'll see, at least in my diagrams, that there is a dashed line for everything. And this is an example of one of the, uh, the ecologies that emerged from this type of description and the analysis. So this is case site one, which is Metropolitan University, located in a capital city. Uh, they have been transitioning to online education uh, for a while, but are predominantly face to face. Uh, they have got a very permissive policy and they have got strategy, which also reflects this. But at the same time, there's quite a bit of tension uh, between the commercial offerings, say through MOOC providers, uh, and also through the open education uh, initiatives that are being run at that, at that university. Now, there are levels of commonality. So you'll find that in most of the case study sites, things like the practitioner values, in other words, what values are these people bringing to their work and to what extent do values inform how they approach open education? Also, open fluency. By open fluency, what I mean is that this is one's ability to recognise um, uh, how to best use open educational resources or open educational practices to add value to the work that they're doing. Um, in terms of MISO system, the learning teaching practices occurred at every one of the case sites. And in the EXO systems, it was things like support and uh, policy, which I'll talk about tonight. Then at the macro system, there were national priorities. Most of the respondents, uh, irrespective of the case study site, mentioned how the federal government and also national bodies impact on one's ability to engage with openness. So I'm going to work my way through those and just give you a taste of the kind of responses that, that um, came from them. And then we'll distill that into um, the calls for action that I concluded the thesis with. Now, in terms then of the, the ideology or the values, um, we have here somebody saying, I don't know if it's altruistic motivation or whether or not just a part of my core values, but I want to be able to help people. This respondent very much spoke about their previous experience um, in having jobs that were explicitly about helping people and realizing that when people don't have access to information, this actually impacts on their quality of life. And so when they became a member of the academic staff, they brought those values and those experiences with them. And that was a core reason why they were involved in open. Also, we had others who said that they saw higher education as an immense privilege and they wanted to see it distributed far more easily. They wanted to be seen as fair, honest, generous, and they wanted to be seen as giving rather than taking. All of these things informed their practice. And also the last one that I have here, um, which came at it from maybe a more pragmatic point of view, but still it was it was a, a sense of, of their values where they said, well, universities are paid by taxpayer funds. In Australia, they account for a huge proportion of our operating budget. Sometimes as much as 80% of our budget will come from taxpayer dollars. And so they were saying, well, the taxpayers already paid for most of this. If we then put it behind a paywall or we make people pay for it a second time, this is really not OK. It didn't sit well with them. What this then also led to was some people engaging in what's termed constructive deviance. Um, and I had a number of folks when I spoke to them about the policy and the workflow around releasing material with an open license, because intellectual property policies were seen as a major constraint to being able to engage fulsomely with open. And I had a number of people who said to me that they were very familiar with the policy. They were very familiar with the workflow. And when I said, what is your experience of doing so? They would say, no idea. I've never used it. 
because they felt very strongly that there were gatekeepers who didn't understand or there were processes that were overly administrative that really didn't fit with, with what they considered to be the spirit of openness or they felt that the uh, the work wasn't understood by people and thus they really didn't have the authority in the, at least from their perspective the gatekeeper didn't have the authority to say whether or not something should be open or not despite the fact that this is enshrined in policy so that's an area that i'm quite interested in following up uh, much later on in terms then of attitudinal factors and this plays to well where are people at are they actually getting involved and overwhelmingly at all three case study sites yes people rated their skills very highly they said that they could locate oer effectively um, that there was uh, quite a few available in their discipline they could easily understand creative commons licenses and that they found it very easily to integrate open with their existing work and even when it came to sharing, when we asked lots of questions about this, um, considering what are the opportunities, what are the challenges for sharing, most people believe that their work was of a high enough quality to share. They also believe that there were reputational benefits to sharing. And so there seemed to be an awful lot of um, a, a sense, at least, from people that they wanted to engage with this and they wanted to see the benefit. If we then look at attitudinal factors around resource use as well, we had a scale around the likelihood to adopt for commercial resources, the self-authored resources for OER. Now, what, I, what happens here is that a lot of the more traditional print-based materials um, tend to be much high, highly regarded when it comes from a commercial publisher. Um, and the intent is definitely to use that kind of content, things like um, research reports and articles, books. Um, however, textbooks were under half of the respondents um, basically said that they were interested in commercial textbooks. When it comes then to self-authored content, staff are more likely to self-author content than they are in a lot of times to use OER or even to look at commercial resources. And this starts to have effects across the board for the types of resources that are being used. Things like um, you know, non-textual resources, audio, video, multimedia, interactive content. This is the type of material that people are starting to say, well, yes, I'm interested in authoring um, or, I, or I have the intent to author. And then when we look at open uh, content, we're finding that, again, if you look at the kinds of things that people are most likely or intend to use uh, most, you're looking at images and diagrams, videos, they're looking for learning activities, class activities, and even open uh, research reports. So this has some implications in terms of what you can do to leverage this kind of intent and um, the desire to be involved at a university. If you've got people who are already self-authoring content, then that represents a potential mine for content to be created, to be shared, to be reused, if that is the way that the institution is wanting to position itself. Also what it does, it means that if you can raise awareness of openly licensed content, then there is a possibility here given the intent to use that is being self-reported, that people may actually branch out and use a wider diversity of materials. And they may also be then looking at multiple forms of representation of the content in their courses, which ultimately means that learners have choice. If we move then along to things like support, support was something that I looked at um, very strongly. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that that's one of the areas that I am involved in, in terms of my day-to-day -day job. Um, how do we actually support people? How do people perceive the support? And realistically, there are a couple of things that came out of this. One, most people at the case study sites saw libraries as the center of activity that was occurring. Many of them mentioned that their learning and teaching units were involved to a much lesser extent 
or in some cases were generally unaware of open and that when they required support they would go to the library. So this represents a huge opportunity for librarians um, to get more involved in these kinds of conversations. And in Australia, at least, there has been a very strong push over the last couple of decades for librarians to be more involved in things like curriculum design. And open represents one of those areas where the types of connections and the reputation that libraries have do have a very strong value and they are something that can be leveraged so that librarians can actually get into those conversations. There was also a sense of vulnerability uh, in terms of the support and this really was about um, the academic staff in particular noting that support for open like support for most other things in the university is demarcated by organizational unit not by the actual type of support that they wanted. And so as a result, many of the academic staff um, would report that they would engage with, say, a librarian at the beginning, and then they would ask for support, say, in learning design, or they would need some support in media production and the like. They would then need to contact a completely separate organisational unit, and they would need to have that conversation all over again. And a lot of the academic staff were noting that, one, if we could have a single area that you could contact and get support from, then this would be absolutely critical to them getting involved in open. Or if there was a role for one unit to become almost like a project manager for them so that that way the curriculum design um, could be um, collaborated upon, but then somebody within the support teams would then act as a point of contact to coordinate support across multiple teams. It also meant that academic staff could become more aware of the types of support that were available to them, rather than having to try and work their way through, for example, the, uh, the institutional web page to find out who can actually help them. This also brings then to one of the last points that I have here, which is about um, how we communicate. I broke this up because predominantly we had academic staff, and in this case, the academic staff were teaching staff. The professional staff were often librarians, learning designers, people who supported the process. Copyright officers also um, were part of this, this cohort. And I started to look at messaging. And for example, we had a question in here about if you were to describe OER to a colleague, what traits would you emphasize? And they could select up to three. Now in this time, what I'm doing is I'm using the green diamonds are next to points where there is complete alignment between what a, an academic staff member would say and what a professional staff member would say. And so there's a lot of digging into this that could be done around how messaging um, is actually constructed and whether or not the messaging actually has the audience in mind when it does so. And so you can take a look through these and you can see that even though some of these ideas fall into both categories, so when you look down the academic staff, those do appear in the professional staff, but also there are some points which are valued by one group which do not appear on the other group's radar at all. And this also showed up when we started to talk about, well, what are the national priorities? We asked um, all the respondents to uh, put their top five priorities for OER. And what you can see here is that in some cases, we have commonality within a block, but a lot of the times there's quite a lot of disparity between where things are ranked or even if they're on the list. And so the implications for this are very much about how we message, how we actually listen to each other and how things like support are actually structured. So that was really, that they're kind of, as you can well appreciate, trying to sum up everything that was in there. I didn't even try. What I tried to do was give some of the highlights, some of the things that I found interesting along the way. And really what it then boils down to is some of the interrelationships between the, the levels of the ecology 
and then I'm going to leave you with the calls for action. So I would invite you to come back across the next three slides and take a look if you are interested in looking at these because I won't go through all of them. But what they do is um, they try to chart the interaction between the themes, which are then indexed against each level. So for example, um, if you, at the very base level, when you have microsystems, the practitioner values, and then up into the MISO system of learning and teaching practices, often people found that engaging in open educational practice and using it in teaching and learning was a way of them embedding their core values into the main work that they did every day. And when they were able to do that, they expressed a greater satisfaction with what they did. And they also expressed the notion that what they were doing, they felt was powerful and important and that that got them enthused about learning and teaching. Now, when you take a look through all of these, you'll see that um, in the first instance, I focus very much on the, the microsystem. And then after that, um, start to move into the other systems as well. So in this case, uh, one of the ones that came up was um, one of the themes was open fluency. This theme here, your ability to understand and to leverage open, um, whether it be resources or practices, to add value to what you're currently doing. This, of course, has implications for things like policy, and it also has implications into copyright because you need to understand both of these. And then the question is whether or not your policy, whether or not copyright, whether it be support or the copyright environment is such that it actually does support what you are trying to do. Lastly, um, I then go up into um, the interaction uh, with the macro systems. And so often, participants uh, expressed that there was things like um, the lack of government funding in order to support things like large scale grants. It's been a very long time in Australia since we have had a national office for learning and teaching that administered national grants. And this has put downwards pressure on the level of competitiveness for all other research funding and teaching and learning funding nationally. And so the ability to, for example, buy in resources, buy out time or bring in people who are able to help you to realise um, these kinds of aspirations, you find that the resources, especially the financial resources, are simply not there. And so people are looking for alternate ways to go about embedding open and exploring it especially in terms of things like workload intensification, which I know is not unique to Australia. Um, this is something which really makes people think about how they are going to engage in something new. And when we are talking about people's development, then it really is bridging where you're at with where you want to be. So I would encourage you to take a look over them with um, to, with a bit more detail and um, we can certainly cover that again in the questions. This leads me then to the last part, which is really distilling this down into what I consider to be actions, things that we can actually do that arise out of the case studies and out of this ecology. So the first one is around building staff capacity and practice. And you'll see here that with each one of these, I've indexed it to an ecology level, sources of influence, in case people actually wanted to put this into practice, and then concrete actions for realization. So in terms of building staff capacity and practice, many staff said that they, they lack the channels to share practice or to see examples of what open looked like in practice. So again, these are very simple, very actionable things that can be done to highlight, to build awareness and to gain, uh, to gather levels of engagement. In terms of stimulating engagement, then um, you can also look at how you manage to communicate the value of openness, how you promote things like open fluency, and how you get people to share their, their uh, experiences. In many cases, for example, people uh, often support staff when they were running things like workshops and the like, they would run them by themselves. 
the people who had the most success were those who worked in collaboration with their academic colleagues or collaborated outside of their unit and were thus able to show a range of viewpoints that people could then connect with. Creating an evidence base, uh, most Australian institutions um, didn't, um, didn't actually have a really solid notion of how they were going to um, measure the impact or measure the success of open. And so evidence-based practice, which again is something that libraries have been involved in for, for quite a long time, this is something that could come into play here and provide a leadership opportunity or in a much broader sense for business intelligence units and the like within a university. Fourth, the deploying solutions for OER access and discoverability. This was one that crops up time and time again, and it is really about where do we put things? Um, do we build a repository? This is something that I tend to react fairly strongly to because um, often what we have is people say, well, one of the major things that contribute to people not engaging is that, is that practitioners note that we have far too many places to look for open content. There's no real aggregated search. There are a couple um, of aggregated search, but again, they don't go across all of the repositories. And so people explain, or practitioners explain, that having too many places to go inhibits their ability to effectively engage with open. In response, an awful lot of universities say, well, when we, when we get our open content, we need to build another repository. In other words, we need to build another place that exacerbates the problem. So rather than doing that, looking for existing platforms, looking for existing communities and going out to those communities rather than expecting communities to come to us, which in many cases is a complete turnabout for some functions within an institution. Communicating pedagogical intent. Uh, is another one where at this level, this is the ability to not only produce content or produce frameworks or anything else, but to also communicate the rationale for them, the audience, the pedagogical design, these types of things which help someone to um, interpret and to mediate the use of the content. There are examples of this, but they're all outside of Australia. MIT, for example, now has instructor notes that sit with a lot of their open courses and a lot of their open content, which helps an individual to understand why it was created and what purpose it serves. And so there is definitely an opportunity for distinctiveness to become involved in something like this. The second last one is positioning social justice as central to OEP. This one speaks very much to the practitioner values. Now you recall that I said beforehand that um, practitioners, especially academic teaching staff, were saying that the ability to see their values enacted in their learning and teaching practice made them feel more satisfied. They, made, they, they felt that they were having a greater impact and that they were doing the things that they thought a university should be doing. If we actually position the notion that open is about um, access, it is about inclusion, it is about diversity, it is about equity, these are the kinds of values that, that for those practitioners, they will be able to latch onto, and that will act as a catalyst for them to get involved. And lastly, looking at existing policy. And in terms of most Australian university policy, we have um, quite um, permissive policy environments for our research. So the idea is that an academic staff member or any staff member involved in research owns the intellectual property of their research, unless there are reasons they shouldn't, for example, grant um, applications and the like. But this notion that research belongs to you, you can do with it as you please, you can license it as you please, your learning and teaching is owned by the university and is not shared. Most places have very non-permissive policy environments. So again, there is an opportunity here to revisit this and to also look at policy reform at both the institutional level, but then also looking for reform at the national level. So I'll leave you at the moment just um, to say that really, if I was to recap, context is key. 
when you're when you're looking at this ecology. Really, I feel that the process that I went through here is very much transferable across contexts. And one of the things that I'm really keen to do is to see if, if it can be applied at other universities across the Australian sector um, and really start to explore these ecologies in more detail. It can be used as a moment in time, and really that's the way that this entire research should be looked at, is that it captures a single point in time and that it does not in any way um, suggest that this is still the way in which things are happening because there's been a range of activities in the Australian environment that have actually catalyzed some more action in open. It can be used to inform strategy priorities and also where you wanna allocate your resources. And I think that there are very strong opportunities for this to be um, applied to networks, to communities, or even consortia who are wanting to work together and to understand each other more and to really lay down some uh, strategic partnerships for openness. So I'm going to conclude there and really ask you about what, what you're thinking about at the moment and um, to what extent um, you wanted me to go into any further detail or if you had any further ideas. So um, I'll pass back over.